Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, QualCare Inc., a managed care company administering health plans that care about your health care, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Verizon. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey, and by Observer New Jersey Politics. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Steve Adubato here. We're talking uh, the big picture in healthcare with our good friend Barry Ostrowski, president and CEO, R.W.J. Barnabas Health. Good to see you, Barry. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Steve. How quickly does this healthcare landscape change in the state and nation? Well, the nation has changed to a great extent already. New Jersey still lags behind in terms of financing health care. We're fee for service and open, mm. open access for the most part. We anticipate that's going to change over the next five to seven years, placing greater pressure on providers to live within a financial risk model that really doesn't yet exist. And, of course, it's continually putting more pressure on consumers mm. who are finding out-of-pocket responsibilities to have been increased and navigating through a complicated healthcare system is always difficult. So I think we probably, because we've lagged behind in New Jersey and some of these developments, are going to face a rush of change over the next five to seven years. RWJ Barnabas, this significant healthcare system, talks about making communities healthier. Describe it. Well, we think that it's great to, to be able to help people who are sick and treat the conditions that they develop. But the real trick, the real mission, the real objective is to avert illness, to stop people from getting sick or, or developing these conditions. And the truth is you have to get into the communities to do that. Each of our communities around the state have certain social determinants that, that in fact result in people getting sick. And so no matter how good we are at treating sickness, if we don't address those determinants, we aren't going to be, as far as I'm concerned, effective in pursuing the mission. So we've decided, our organization, we've decided to come up with a social impact investment policy. Back up, a social impact investment policy. Right. Now, the word health care isn't even in there. That's right. Why? Be well, because health is a result of the lack of social impact in certain areas. So if you don't look at the residential quality, if you don't look at unemployment issues, if you don't look at the lack of activity in safe environments, if you don't look at the unemployment rates, uh, if you don't look at folks who would like to be educated but can't be for a variety of reasons, if you don't affect positively those criteria, those issues, then you get bad health. So it's not so much the health in those, in those programs that we'll be looking at, it will be the people. They suffer from certain social determinants which lead to bad health. And we're going to develop programs in each of our marketplaces and try to match up what we know with some of those de mm -hmm. social determinants and have a positive impact on it. It's one of those mission-driven notions that will, in fact, take generations before we see the true payback. But we think that's part of what we should be doing. Now, we're going to be talking about the RWJ, Barnabas Healthcare System, what the footprint uh, really is. Uh, but to be clear and to disclose, Barry serves on the board of um, public broadcasting in the state as a supporter. RWJ, Barnabas Health is a supporter. And I've done a lot of leadership development for your organization as well. I know it well. But the footprint is significant for RWJ, Barnabas Health. How many counties? How many people are we talking? 
Well, we cover nine counties, and in those counties, five million people live. Five million. Five million. So in a, in a state of eight and a half million, <clears throat> five million of our fellow residents live within the counties that we serve, not exclusively, obviously, there are other hospitals and healthcare providers, but we have immediate access, and they to us, of five million people. And every marketplace is different. Neighborhoods in Newark are different to neighborhoods in Short Hills and Long Branch and Lakewood and New Brunswick and Rawway. So the program I'm uh, describing has to be designed to get to the issues that are most relevant to those communities. It's a, not a one-size-fits-all. We have 33,000 employees and we have 9,000 physicians who honor us with their, their business. Uh, we think we have the intellectual capacity and the clinical capacity mm -hmm. to address these things. It's going to be very exciting for us and I think when all is said and done, it's one of the ways that a healthcare institution like ours can be more than a destination for sick people. If we're going to be successful, then we have to invest in our communities. Uh, the towns in which we're located have to understand that we're there to make a meaningful, positive impact, not just simply keep our emergency department open, uh, awaiting people who are sick. But, Barry, you, you clearly you need partners to do this because getting into the community, being pay, more patient-centric, requires that the whole paradigm shift and you're dealing more with religious organizations, you're dealing with social service agencies. You've been doing it all along, but isn't it even more important than ever before, right? It truly is, and you know, Steve, because you've led this initiative to bring together small, mission-driven, local organizations that are not for profit. Non I was just exactly, say. not for profit, who struggle with resource to do their, and pursue their mission. You help us meet with them at least quarterly. A community advisory board that we exactly. bring together. Exactly. In this case, it's in Newark. Um, so our plan is to support those organizations. They already have carved out an important mission. They already have a constituency of people who rely on them. So rather than duplicate in any form or fashion that which they're doing, we're going to make resources available to them so they can expand for their constituent users uh, what they do. So if you put this all together and you have an organization like ours with significant resource and a whole array of great skilled folks and you work in tandem mm. with these small organizations, now, you've, now I think you have the ability to really get something done. A small organization, as you well know, has a certain level of skepticism about a big organization coming in and saying, we're going to do something and they're disappointed, and rightfully so, if we don't recognize that which they're doing to enhance the community. So in our they're case, closer. They're, they're closer, they have the trust of the community. So, so it's not our intention in any way, shape, or form to displace those organizations, mm -hmm. but rather to support but, them. But you know, Barry, before I let you out of here, um, <laughs> what I'm curious about is this. Historically, hospitals, healthcare systems, hospital systems, have largely measured, and if I'm wrong, you'll tell me clearly, have measured their success on how many patients have come into the hospital, how many babies are delivered, how, how many, it's a quantitative equation. But unless I don't get this, so much of what is going to be done may potentially not be in the hospital itself, but in the community, then how, then what's the metrics for measuring success? It's a great question. So the metrics that ought to be used is, and there are, they exist already, what's the health of the community? The overall health? The overall health. So how many people suffer from a variety of conditions that we know can be averted? You can, if you treat, if, if you stop obesity, you're gonna stop <clears throat> the raging plagues of diabetes, right. of cardiovascular, and of cancer. People don't realize that one of the most predictable markers for breast cancer is obesity. So, so those will be the metrics on which will eventually be adjudicated. The difficulty is that no one's ever wanted to pay for that. Right. So it's not like Medicare or any of the private insurers will pay you to keep communities healthy. They are solely geared to paying you when someone gets sick. Fee for service. Fee for Different service. Model. Volume makes a difference. So we've got to change that. We think we're big enough to lead that change. And as I say, I think we have the resources and the talent to do it.
Barry Ostrowski is president and chief executive officer of RWJ Barnabas Health. Uh, Barry, as always, thank you for uh, enlightening us on a whole range of important health care issues that matter to all of us. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to welcome Thomas H. Prohl, president, New Jersey State Bar Association. Good to see you. Good to see you. Mr. President, uh, let people know what the Bar Association is and why you're so important. Well, we're the member organization for New Jersey attorneys. We have about 18,200 members at this point, always looking to build that. But we stand up for access to justice issues, fairness in the judiciary, and we're also the zealous advocates for judicial independence, particularly when the judiciary is under attack. We stand up and speak out for them as well. Is the judiciary under attack? Well, <laughs> <laughs> loaded question, I yeah. know. Turn the TV on every single day. And, yeah. um, you know, that's one of the unique features of the judiciary is they have ethical canons that they have to abide by. And so sometimes they can't come to their own defense. That's our role. And so we stand up for that third branch, that co-equal branch of government, to make sure they're protected and, and they can decide cases and administer justice freely and fairly. And the connection between the Bar Association and the Supreme Court is? Well, we often appear as what they call Mika Curia, friend of the court. We go in and we provide the guidance and wisdom of our members, and our members are very diverse from all types of practice areas. And so where an issue comes up before the court where it impacts access to justice or our mission statement, we'll go in and provide information and guidance to the court, So they and they ultimately make the decision, but we like to have them all the information and provide that to them when we can. So. Why a lawyer? Why a lawyer? You. Yeah. Oh, well. What is it, a trick question? Yeah, no. Come on, you get asked that all the time. <clears throat> Seriously, I do. why a lawyer? You know, um, I'll tell you, back in the 90s, I was in the Peace Corps. I was in Nepal. I was well, sitting so on a mountain. This. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so I, um, my, and I had my master's in public health, environmental right. and occupational health. I had a trajectory of going into health and education, these sorts of things. And you may remember in the 90s, there was this very caustic political environment with regards to LGBT people. And I'm openly gay. I'm the first openly gay president right. of the state bar in 118 years and I will say I became upset and when I get upset I advocate I, I go after things and so my goal was the goal of equality and so what happened in the 90s between don't ask don't tell and throwing people out of everything just because they're gay it really got me upset and it got me motivated to change the world for the better for my people so with that, I changed my trajectory. I went into the law, and the rest, as they say, is history. But um, I helped found an organization, Garden State Equality. Great I've, organization. Yeah, and I formed um, the LGBT rights section with a few other uh, like-minded folks. And we advocated on marriage equality, the anti-bullying Bill of Rights. And with that, I had a, a co-interest in advocating in the law on many other issues, in particular environmental issues. So those all came together, and I ascended to the presidency that way. Marriage equality, how are we doing? Well, it's the law of the land, but you know, you can look down in Alabama and you see even the chief justice of the court <laughs> like, down there doesn't that? get it. Yeah, so, um, you know, he's his own problem and he's got a lot of uh, issues going on there. But uh, in New Jersey, it seems to be going pretty well. I mean, there's always room for improvement. And I think, um, you know, we look to advocate now on the minutia of making sure people are recognized and have their full rights. Mm -hmm. And so there's that. But Talk yeah. about the environmental piece, it means a lot to you. Yeah, I uh, did environmental enforcement for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for about five years. I did that while I was going to law school. So it's a, you know, it's where my heart was. I was the president of my environmental group at my university, Emory in Atlanta. And back in the day, we started a recycling program, but they were going to build a uh, retreat, uh, a hotel a conference center in a retreat-like setting, and they were going to clear a seven-acre forest. And so I was a bit of an activist with that, and we went and had a funeral for the forest. We put a coffin together and stuffed some branches, went to the administration building, and then we also went around campus and did guerrilla theater of the Lorax. So 
Yeah, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. I'm also in charge of the brown barbalutes frisking about in their bar. I could go on and on. You, do, you remember the whole thing? Remember the whole thing, yeah. And so we would go around and, and act out the Lorax, uh, yeah. about a dozen of us, and, and we raised awareness of environmental issues. And I was also working at CNN at the time, in Earth Matters was the program, and they came over and did a story on the environmental activism of students in the 90s. And so they featured not me, but the group, and right. of course, since I worked there, I wasn't in the program, but yeah, so that's where I sort of got my start with environmental issues. I realized we have to leave this world to children, and so we just have to take good care and be good stewards of the environment. So. Let me ask you this. With the Bar Association, what do you see the role being with respect to educating the public about the role of the courts and the, often the the misunderstanding that many people have about activism of the courts. Because we've had many legislators on. I've had interesting conversations with Governor Christie uh, about his perception of the role of the courts. And people will talk about the court is too activist. They're too engaged in public policy. Uh, they should be making public policy. It's not their job, you say. Well, you know, so the state bar does educate through its foundation. We have a foundation that does a massive amount of education around the state to the public. And so we provide them a lot of information about the role of the courts. And the, the courts are truly our guardians of democracy. Their role is there to call the balls and the strikes of the law. And when something goes a afield, they are there to set it straight. And I, the perfect example is marriage equality. You know. I went to the legislature to seek my equal rights and I had the door slammed in my face repeatedly. I then went to the courts and the courts understood that our constitutional equal protection of the law means something. And if you're gonna treat one person one way, you gotta treat other people the same way. That's what equality means. And so, you know, people talk about this activist court. I don't see that. I see a really reserved, restrained New Jersey Supreme Court that just calls the balls and the strikes. And when something goes off, they will set it right. And if the legislature and the governor don't deal with it, that's why we have a court. Correct. They just correct the errors. And they deal with what's not being dealt with. Yeah, I mean, so statutes, by their, left, uh, statutes by their nature are, are complex, and but they don't always answer all the questions. The court will sometimes fill in the gaps where there's a vagueness or something needs to be decided. Thomas H. Prohl is the president of the New Jersey State Bar Association, an organization that uh, plays a very important role in our lives in this state, whether we realize it or not. Thank you, Thomas. We appreciate it and we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to uh, welcome Mr. Larry Hazard, Sr., Commissioner, New Jersey State Athletic Control Board in 2010. He was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, member of the Newark uh, Sports Hall of Fame. <clears throat> Good to see you, Larry. My pleasure. Nice to be on. You know, um, <clears throat> you're an icon in the uh, world of sports and boxing, and, and uh, I want to welcome you to, to our show. By the way, let's let people know, where were you born and raised? Newark. Newark. 15th Avenue, 15th and Mars Avenue. When did boxing come into your life? 1957. Because? Dr. Timothy Steele. Tim Steele opened up a small boxing gym in the Hayes Homes housing project on 17th Avenue. And, um, you know, guys used to hang out on the corners, and boxing was a very popular sport, you know, in Newark. And there were quite a number of guys in the neighborhood who, who boxed. And, of course... There you are. Uh, yes. That's, that's you. It's me and Danny and Alvin Johnson and Freddie Johnson, Arthur Randolph. Why do you remember all those guys? Because <clears throat> these, these were my brothers, man. You know, we, we were... These, you know, I was the youngest, I was the youngest guy in the club. So I was like the little, you know, little brother. And these were my big brothers, you know, mm -hmm. they took care of me. And um, we did a lot of things together. We shared a lot of uh, uh, things uh, together. We, we fought throughout the state of New Jersey. We won a lot of 
uh, amateur championships as a team, the Duke is AC. We were known throughout the state. Wow. Yes, that's 1960. Wow. Okay. 1960, I was 15 years old when that picture was taken. There's Dr. There's Tim Steele on the wow. end. He was like our father. He was our surrogate father. In boxing, you've been a commissioner. Yes. You've regulated boxing. Referee? Yes. You've boxed? Yes. You were close with Ali? Yes, very close. I say Muhammad Ali, you say? A beautiful man, beautiful, humanitarian. He was more than a boxer. You know, he was a special gift to the world that God gave us as a human being. There. What made him so special? Because, because he was who he was. I mean, you know, he, he exuded all of the qualities that uh, we would aspire to be as human beings. He was, was, a, was an athlete. Um, he had courage. He stood on his beliefs. And he just loved people, mm. you know. And, and he, he was just a great role model. And most people that saw him, they saw him as an athlete. Yeah. But those of us who really knew him, mm. we knew him for the great human being that he was. You know what's so interesting is you were actually in the movie Ali. Yes. What role? Well, I played um, another one of my role models, referee Zach Clayton. That's right. I played the role of Zach Clayton, who was the original referee in the Rumble in the Jungle. That's Ali is the, the major fight there. That's uh, Ali played by Will Smith, and that's uh, George Foreman on the canvas. So, 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 so that George Foreman fight, I don't want to get too much into detail here, but when you were watching that, this is after Ali loses to Joe Frazier, right? People are thinking Ali is never going to be the Ali again. They give him no chance to win against the powerful George Foreman. People were so afraid of George Foreman. Did you, knowing Ali, believe he had any chance to beat George Foreman? Yeah, I believe that he could win. I believe, because, you know, Ali, Ali would mesmerize guys before they even got in the ring. This way? And, yeah, in mind, the head? In the head, plus he had the skills. And as you know, that's when he introduced the infamous or famous rope Ropa dope, dope. Yes. So he said, go ahead. He put his hands up. Yes. He said, go yes. ahead, hit me. Yes. And so while his hands were up, were most of the shots here? Because a lot of them looked like they were coming <laughs> in. So he withstood it. He withstood it, and George got tired, OK? And, and that was it. That's all she wrote. And uh, he came through. Yeah. As, as, uh, it was no big surprise to me. Wow. The other thing I know about you is you're an educator. You're an educator. Tell folks where you did your educating in the Newark Public Schools. Well, well, I started out at Arts High School as a mm. physical education and health teacher, coach, athletic director. Then uh, I got a quick promotion after a few years. I went to Westside High School as a vice principal. I stayed there for three, four years. Then they sent me to Broadway Junior High My School. My Junior High School. Yes. Broadway Junior Broadway High. Broadway Junior High School as a principal. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I originally started out, I wanted to go to law school. But when I started teaching, I just fell in love with those kids. Mm. And that, along with the fact that I started moving through the system so quickly, yeah. you know, by the time I got to Broadway Junior High School, my career as a referee was really blossoming. I was globetrotting all over the world. Right. I had been to Japan, Korea. I'd been all over by the time I got to Broadway. And then Governor Tom Kane appointed me as the boxing commissioner. They had the whole thing, to regulate it. The whole bill, the whole Before thing. I let you go, I want you to talk about your uh, philanthropic work. Talk about your, uh, the work you're doing to help kids. Sure. Combat. Well, Combat is a nonprofit organization that I started back in the early 90s. And um, I wanted to be like Tim Still was for me. And the only mechanism, or the mechanism that I felt was best for me, what I knew, was boxing. Mm. But in addition to, to boxing, I felt that once I got kids' attention and I got them in the gym, then I would surround them with positive adults, like I was surrounded with, positive men who wanted to make men out of youngsters.
Mm. And that's what I did. That was my model. The Duke of AC was my model. And when I got those kids in there, you know, I got positive trainers. I got people in there mm. that really cared about youngsters. We brought in speakers. Sure. We brought in uh, people to teach them life skills, teach them stay away from gangs, you know. And one went to the Olympics. Oh, he's, he's, he's fighting on the 14th. As we speak Shakur. right now. Yes. As we, what's he's his name? Shakur Stevenson. What's that He'll feel be, like for you? No matter uh, what happens in these games, what's it like for you? Well, that's, that, you know, like they say, if you can just save one. <laughs> but Shakur, see, Shakur was this. His grandfather was one of our trainers, mm. Wally Moses. He brought the kid to the gym with him. He was only five years old. And he would bring him to the gym with him every day. And he would train along with the rest of the kids. And he was surrounded by all of these positive adults. Then his mother, he moved from Newark, I think, to Virginia. And he connected, wow. he connected with someone else, another positive adult who just instilled all of these yeah. great concepts into this young man. He's never been in trouble. And now here he is standing at the pinnacle of winning a gold medal, and we're all pulling for him. Larry Hazard, Sr., Commissioner of New Jersey State Athletic Control Board. Thank you, Mr. Hazard. Appreciate it. You Thank honor you. us. My Stay pleasure. Stay right there. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Qualcare Inc., NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Verizon. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.